Squadron Level. SpaceX Crew-1 astronauts before their launch aboard the SpaceX Crew Dragon to the International Space Station, which is scheduled for this Saturday, November 14th at 7.49 p.m. Eastern Time. From left, our mission specialist, Shannon Walker, pilot, Victor Glover, and Crew Dragon Commander, Mike Hopkins, all NASA astronauts. And mission specialist, Suichi Noguchi, Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency astronaut. NASA's SpaceX Crew-1 mission is the first crew rotational flight of a U.S. commercial spacecraft with astronauts to the International Space Station. The crew arrived to NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida yesterday and is joining us from crew quarters. We'll give them a chance to make brief remarks, and then we'll take questions from the phone line and social media. Participants on the phone can press star one to let us know that you have a question, and those joining us at home can ask questions on social media using the hashtag AskNASA. With that, over to you, Mike. Okay, thanks, Megan, and good afternoon, and thank you to everyone that is joining us today. As you can imagine, we're very excited to be here in Florida at Kennedy Space Center for the final days before our launch to the International Space Station. It's pretty amazing. We've been here less than 24 hours, and in that time, we have seen our rocket, we've seen our space vehicle resilience, and we've seen our spacesuits. And so for an astronaut, that's considered a pretty good day. Um, as we speak to you today, though, we do want to acknowledge that there are final preparations on the vehicle, the hardware uh, that are ongoing, as well as final reviews at the agency level. And so the, the number of people that are supporting uh, this launch is, are many, and uh, and so we just want to say thank you to all of them that are that are making this uh, this happen. Um, as a crew, we are ready. Um, we are ready for this launch. We are ready for uh, the six months of work that is waiting for us on board the International Space Station, and we are ready for the return. Um, and finally, I just uh, I want to say thank you, thank you to our families, thank you to all the people at NASA, at SpaceX, and around the world that uh, have helped us get to this point. Thank you. All right, we don't have a lot of time, so let's go straight into questions. Let's start with Bill Harwood with CBS News. Hey guys, it's uh, Bill Harwood over here at the Kennedy Space Center. Um, I guess this is for Mike. Uh, you know, this is the first operational flight of a Crew Dragon. Tell us why it's so important to both uh, for, to end NASA's sole reliance on the Soyuz uh, and the value of getting four USOS crew on station for the foreseeable future from a science standpoint. Thanks. You bet, Bill. Hey, uh, thanks for the question. And, you know, I think, um, first of all, I'd say that our relationship that we've had with our, our Russian partners and the, the ability to fly with them to the International Space Station on the Soyuz has been fantastic. Um, that has been a, a great relationship that uh, we've relied on over the years. Uh, but at the same time, it's also good to have your own capabilities. And it's great for our country. It's great for the world to have options in terms of getting into space. And so I think you're seeing uh, this growth in this capability, not only just uh, the ability to get humans into space, but you've seen it already with the ability to get cargo into space. And, and so this is just another step on that process. And then I am really excited, as you mentioned, to see what it's going to be like when we're actually going to have five uh, USOS crew members on board the International Space Station, along with our two Russian colleagues uh, that will be up there with us. But it's going to be exciting to see how much work uh, we're going to be able to get done while we're there. Um, and so I know they've got a plan. We actually yesterday had a chance to kind of see what that first week looks like. Um, and already there's not a lot of gray space on there. So I think they're going to keep us pretty busy. All right, let's go to Chris Davenport with the Washington Post. Hopkins, I mean, human spaceflight is always a challenge. 
But here you've got sort of this double whammy of a pandemic and now potentially this tropical storm bearing down. I'm just wondering what impact that's having on you all and what, uh, if any, effect it's having on all your preparation. Thanks. You bet. Well, it is 2020, so <laughs> I guess the tropical storm, we're not surprised by, by that. Um, it, it has been interesting. In fact, uh, you know, Victor and I, we've been uh, training for this mission for about two years, a little over two years now. Shannon and Suichi, the, they joined us about the time the pandemic started. And, and so uh, as far as they've been concerned, they haven't uh, known training without having to uh, work around the pandemic. And uh, that's really, uh, we've had to do some, some special things to make that happen. That's hap uh, not only to protect us, but also to protect the entire team um, because uh, the trainers, the people that are, that are building uh, the vehicles, the people that um, are sitting in the control rooms, all of that, uh, it, is, it has taken a special effort to, to protect everybody. And, and so that has uh, changed the training flow a little bit. Um, it's uh, put us, I guess, in, in isolation a little bit. It's actually from our family's perspectives as well, as you can imagine, uh, we've had the, you know, they've been a little bit more restrictive um, on their activities as well over the past eight months, uh, just because of the situation that, that we're in. And so it, it's been difficult, but at the same time, I would say people have done an amazing job of, of getting us to, to this point. And, and so I can't say enough about that. As far as the weather, you know, we're looking at that very closely. It has had some impacts on our preparations. They've uh, adjusted uh, when we're gonna roll the vehicle out and, and uh, do static fires and things of that nature. But uh, right now, uh, we're still on a plan to, to be ready to launch on the 14th. Okay, let's go to Camden Hall with Nashville News. And is really for anybody on the crew or Suichi, anybody that has experience with the shuttle. As described at T minus one minute, they say it feels like the shuttle is coming, uh, you know, alive beneath them. Do you feel like that same thing will occur with Falcon 9 at that one minute mark, or do you feel like it'll be much smoother up until that T zero mark? Thank you. Well, I'll take the first question. Yeah. Uh, hello, Nashville. Uh, we'll be uh, very interesting. Uh, interested to, to experience this uh, first uh, dragon for, for all of us. And uh, what we hear from Bob and Doug on the demo one, that, that they have a couple of a very distinct uh, noise or sound as they do the fueling through the, the final stage. And so that's what's kind of a sign of that, that the rocket is uh, fueled up, ready to go. So I'm uh, really anxious to, to feel that the vibration. All right, let's go to Gina Sinceri with ABC News. This is for Commander Hopkins. Uh, how are the sleeping arrangements going to work on a space station? It seems like you're short one sleeping pod <laughs> with five of you up there. So that's a, uh, that's a great question. That's a great observation as well. Um, yes, we are currently short uh, one crew quarters on board station. I will say that the ISS program is working on that and there are plans to, to have a, a temporary station um, that will be up there. Not sure when it's going to arrive. It could arrive mid-mission or uh, it may not get up there while we're still on board. Uh, so in the interim, uh, they are exploring options that uh, where, where I can sleep. Um, including on uh, the vehicle itself, on resilience itself. And so I think that's the uh, at least the leading candidate for um, initially when we get on board, but we'll continue to evaluate that uh, throughout the mission and make sure that's the, the right place. Okay, now to Dan Bowen with Fox 5 New York. Hey guys, Dan Bowen with Fox 5 New York. Thank you so much. Uh, two questions if it's okay. The first question, but when you all leave to when you come back, the country could look very different uh, with the vaccine potential and a new administration. Is that something you guys have to keep in mind or sort of compartmentalize? The next question for Victor. Victor, we just had history with the first uh, black woman elected as vice president. You'll make history with this flight. And uh, that's something you can kind of put into perspective for us. I mean, you want to go ahead and just take a vote? Yep. Yeah. Yes, you know, so the world is going to look different, hopefully. Uh, I would I would love to see, and hey, Dan, how you doing? Uh, I, I hope that it's mainly based on the fact that we have a, a vaccine and that people can go about, uh, uh, you know, taking care of the things they need to take care of in their in their normal lives uh, safely. 
So that's that's the biggest thing that I that I hope happens. And you know, I I think uh, to put this in context, it. It, it is something to be celebrated once we accomplish it. And, you know, I'm, I am uh, honored to be in this position and to be a part of this great and experienced crew. And I look forward to getting up there and doing my best to make sure that, uh, you know, we are worthy of all the work that's been put into to setting us up for this mission. So, uh, but, you know, unlike the election, you know, that uh, is in the past or at least is receding into the past where this mission is still ahead of me. So let's get there and then uh, I'll talk to you after I get on board. How about that? Okay, let's go to Paul Rivera with WESH 2 News. Good to see you all. This is to the group. I was just curious about your reaction of the news of uh, Administrator Jim Bridenstine stepping down once the president-elect is sworn in. Do you also think that that's going to affect in any way future NASA astronauts and the mission moving forward? Jim, you want to take it? Uh, well, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I know it's it's customary for the administ uh, people in the administration to submit their resignations and then we have to take it from there. Honestly, I have no idea what will come after that. I assuming that we will continue on with our Artemis mission and just keep doing what we've been doing at NASA because that's what we do. Okay, let's go to Mike Brown with Inverse. Hi guys. Um, yeah, thank you very much for uh, taking the time to speak with us. Um, my question is, uh, this flight is uh, several hours um, to the International Space Station, and uh, I'm, I'm curious what that's like to um, uh, sort of be in that position for several hours. I mean, uh, how do you stay comfortable? Uh, uh, how do you go to the bathroom? Uh, uh, how do you eat? Uh, what, what is it like sort of uh, spending the day on this, um, on this trip? Yeah, so that's actually one of the interesting parts about uh, this particular mission is, you know, when Bob and Doug launched, there were only two people. And, and so we're going to be figuring out uh, some of that as we go, because uh, we'll be the first crew on it with uh, four of us, a full crew. And, and so uh, right now, uh, the way the launch looks, it's going to be a uh, day one rendezvous. So uh, I think about a little over eight hours after we launch, we should be docking to the International Space Station. So there's not going to be a lot of time. Uh, we're not anticipating that we're going to have to have a sleep period or anything of that nature. Uh, but at the same time, if we were to slip to the next day, it becomes more of a 24, 25, I think even maybe 27 hour rendezvous. So now uh, that question becomes even more relevant because now we're spending a, a, a quite a bit more time on board the vehicle. So I think it really depends a little bit on uh, the length of the mission. Shannon, you want to? I was just going to add, even if we do have our shortened rendezvous and, and get there in eight and a half hours, I know as a crew, we're going to evaluate the choreography that it takes to do things in that yeah. capsule so we can uh, inform future crews when they have four uh, people and we'll probably have longer rendezvous. Okay, Morgan McFall Johnson with Business Insider. Hi, thanks so much for taking my question, and this is for any and all of you. Um, overall, how are your nerves holding up ahead of being only the second group of people ever to fly on this new vehicle? Um, and relatedly, I'm also wondering what your thoughts are about this recent Falcon 9 incident where a masking lacquer clogged up the borehole and an engine relief valve and led to a launch abort. Just wondering what your reaction was to learning about that and if you've had any conversations with SpaceX about it. Thanks so much. I'll take the second part of that, that question in terms of uh, the issues that, that occurred on the aborts of the launch. Uh, basically, you know, I started in my, uh, when I had my opening remarks, I talked about the number of people um, that have been working on this mission. And it truly is staggering when you look at those. And, and so all of those issues uh, that you're uh, referring to, they've been looked at very closely. They're still being looked at, they're being reviewed. And we have absolute faith and trust in uh, the team that is doing that, and, and so we know that uh, when we walk to that launch pad on Saturday, that everybody has assured that that vehicle is is ready. Uh, as far as the nerves, um, you know, it's like it's like anything. We're not quite there yet, right? And so sometimes, if uh, you know, I had the a football background, and and so you know, the nerves start to really pile on as you get closer to to launch. And uh, but at the same time, uh, we're having a 
a, a very good time here in crew quarters. Uh, they're feeding us very well. Can't complain at all with that. Uh, we're having a lot of good laughs. And at the same time, uh, we're going through a lot of our final preparations, a lot of our final briefings, final reviews, uh, things of that nature, and that's all going well. And so I think that helps uh, keep the nerves down a little bit as well because you're just kind of going like clockwork through the, the procedure and the timeline. Okay, Marcia Dunn with the Associated Press. Yes, hi. Um, hello again. I'm wondering, what is the most valuable piece of advice you've gotten from Bob and or Doug? And do you know if they're going to be coming, coming to watch your launch in person? Thanks a lot. Yeah, so I think from uh, coming to launch, watch the launch in person, uh, much like for their launch, the numbers are, are very restricted right now. Um, just because of the, the situation with the pandemic. So I do not believe either one of them are, are going to be here. Uh, we've, we've had an opportunity to talk with them, not only right after they got on orbit, but then after they returned home. And so we kind of got some advice uh, through, um, uh, through the different phases of the mission, if you will. And, and I'll let everybody kind of, uh, if they want to jump in with something they heard from them that, that they thought was very helpful. I think for me, one of the uh, the best piece of advice from, from Doug when we were talking about the landing piece, uh, he, he talked about staying ahead of the vehicle. And, uh, and that just means, you know, making sure you are, are thinking ahead of the next step, the next phase. It's, it's very similar to what we see when we're in the flying world, when you're out there in, our, in the jets that we're flying around. And, and so I thought that was a good piece of advice that as we're getting ready to come into land, things are going to start happening very fast. And you just need to make sure you're staying ahead of the vehicle in each, each phase as we went through that. Something that uh, Bob and Doug mentioned to us, uh, as Soichi said earlier, is all of the different sounds that, that we're going to have during the, the tanking as well as during ascent uh, uh, on the way to orbital insertion. And I would say that my personal favorite, though, was to think about with four of us uh, how we were going to pack our food. And so we actually <laughs> rearranged our food to make sure that it, it, it was easy to access and it also made sense considering that there are four of us. Yeah. So. Yeah. And I, I would add along to that, not just packing the food, but dealing with things inside the capsule and how to do that efficiently so it doesn't eat your lunch while you're trying to accomplish other things. Oh, nice. <laughs> Honestly, <Dan. laughs> Strong side. Stronger side. <laughs> All right, let's go to Paul Brinkman with UPI. Okay, um, yeah, I guess I'd just like to kind of follow on with the uh, discussions about uh, the capsule, and uh, thanks for taking my question. Um, and Shannon, um, the, the four of you have been inside a, a Dragon before, um, suited up, and you also flew uh, in a Soyuz before. Um, can you just kind of talk about what that was like to be in there? Um, did it feel crowded at all? It probably clearly roomier than a Soyuz, but, um, and also, do you think that uh, seven people could ever fit inside the capsule? Because I know that's been discussed before. Thanks. Yeah, it's interesting since um, the Soyuz, where you normally see the crews sitting inside the Soyuz is a pretty small space, um, but above that, you have a space where there's cargo. So between the two spaces on a Soyuz, it's probably only slightly smaller than a um, the Dragon capsule, um, although I think they have more cargo on a Soyuz um, staged about. So with um, four people, I think it does feel more spacious because it's one volume instead of two volumes that you have to move about in. I think seven people, that may be a little, that'll be sporty to see how you could handle seven people, but you wouldn't have any cargo in there. So um, right. there'd be room for them, but then again, it's, it's the, uh, choreography of managing all your stuff when you have to get out of your spacesuits and into your regular clothes where you're going to stage everything and, and put away your spacesuits can be is, is going to be difficult with seven people. Okay, Robert Perlman with Collect Space. Thank you. For anyone on the crew who wants to take it, I know that you're flying a new spacecraft but is there anything on board resilience that flew aboard Demo 2, crew transfer bags, or any of your crew equipment? Are you reusing anything? I, as far as I know, I think everything that that we have on board is, is new. Um, I guess there could be some common bags or, or things of that nature that maybe are, are getting reused, but uh, it is, is definitely new. And I know 
I believe like with the Soyuz, they'll actually use pieces and, mm -hmm. and parts out of uh, ones that have already flown in, in the next vehicle, like control panels and things of that nature. But uh, in our case, no, I think everything is, is new. Okay, let's go to Andrew Havernick with KY3. Uh, hi, yes, thanks for taking my question. Uh, this is for Mike. Uh, kind of a two-part uh, two question. Um, what is What does this partnership between SpaceX and NASA really kind of mean for the future of um, uh, just space travel and just NASA's future? And uh, from for you, for a personal standpoint, I'm based here at the Lake of the Ozarks, your hometown, um, uh, small town Missouri. What, what does this whole kind of um, – uh, uh, mission mean for you and mean for this area and the people that live here, maybe the students that go to uh, your alma mater? Yeah, I'll start with the, the second uh, part of that. And, and I would say, um, you know, for all of us in terms of our, our alma maters and where we've come from, I, I think it's uh, it just tells you that anything is possible, right? I mean, when I was growing up in uh, at the lake there, going to school of the Osage, I, I never would have thought uh, that, that someday I was going to be sitting here um, getting ready to launch to the International Space Station on a brand new vehicle. Um, and, and so it is It is kind of amazing, but I think it's a, a good reminder that, that anything is possible. And if you're, if you're willing to work hard and, and uh, keep after it, um, it starts with a big dream and, uh, and then you just keep going. And, and so I think if we can inspire um, the folks around there, I, I, I hope that, uh, that maybe that does. And, and um, and someone's fallen in our footsteps, and someday someone from Lake of the Ozarks is uh, putting a foot on Mars. That would be pretty pretty amazing. Yeah. Uh, in terms of the relationship between SpaceX and NASA, and what that means for future uh, space flight, I I think it's just it's it's part of this opening the door, um, particularly right now of low Earth orbit to uh, more and more human space flight. You know, so currently right now the the customer is NASA. But uh, in, in terms of uh, other customers, I know they're out there. And in fact, I, I believe SpaceX is, is looking at some other customers at this point. And I'm sure Boeing and, and other contractors that are out there are looking at it as well. And so I think you're going to see um, as, as this relationship grows, I think it's a fantastic thing that we're going to have more and more people that are going to have access to, to low, low Earth orbit and not just um, astronauts that are coming from professional agencies like NASA, like JAXA, um, like we're sitting here in front of you today. Okay, let's go to Amy Thompson with Space.com. Hi there, thanks for taking my question. Um, I was wondering if you guys had picked out a zero-G indicator and um, what it would be. Y yes, yes and no. Yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so there's, uh, you know, that is one of the neat traditions uh, of human spaceflight is the zero-G indicator, and we are going to continue that tradition, and I, um, we're going to save the revealing until we're, uh, the second stage is cut off, and, and hopefully it'll become pretty obvious at that point. Okay, Irene Klotz with Aviation Week. Thanks. Um, I was wondering for um, maybe Shannon and Michael, what uh, changes as far as just lifestyle you're expecting and preparing for with having seven people living on the space station um, when when you all were there was smaller crews and sometimes much smaller. And uh, one quick follow-up for you, Mike, is um, on Shannon's question, is it you personally that's volunteered slash been drafted to uh, have the temporary cabin in resilience or wherever that ends up. Jenny, you want to start with life and then all life. Yeah. Um, it's going to be interesting. I think having um, one of the big things we're going to have to be more mindful of is, is the scheduling of everything, especially yeah. the exercise equipment, because we all have to exercise every day. It's hugely important. And so there's um, much, much tighter schedules uh, associated with the exercise equipment, um, which will give us less flexibility in the rest of our day. So you have to exercise when you have to exercise. Um, I think um, it might be a little more crowded around the dinner table, but that's okay. <laughs> um, and we'll all have more food we to keep share. Coming back to food. Yeah, <laughs> food. 
Yeah, and so actually uh, there's a, a position in mission control called, called the, the ops planner. And they're the person that's putting together our, our daily schedule. And I think uh, for those uh, those folks, it's going to get much more challenging because when we talk about not just exercise equipment, but there's the the comm, um, the video loops, all of those feeds. You know, like when we're doing experiments and things like that, uh, there's a lot of the uh, investigators want to be able to see what we're doing in real time. Yeah. And now all of a sudden, you could potentially have five different people working on five different experiments on the uh, on the international space station and so do we have the resources that that enable that and so i think that is certainly going to uh to to bring some challenges with it uh in terms of the uh in terms of the me being in the in sleeping in dragon i don't necessarily look at it as uh, drawing the short straw though we maybe did a little bit of rock paper scissors for that or <laughs> gunman dragon man karate man <laughs> um no, actually, though, I think there's a tradition, uh, Soichi, that uh, oftentimes in uh, with the shuttle days, I think the commanders usually well, slept usually in the co cockpit. So. Yeah, the commander usually slept in the cockpit, and so I think, uh, at least for me, it just felt like uh, that was that was where um, I needed to be. Um, if any of us were going to sleep there, I, I felt like it uh, it should have been me. Okay, Nicholas Samuel with Vero News. Hi, this is Nicholas Samuel here. Uh, this question is for Victor Glover. Uh, Victor, uh, thanks for taking my question. Can you talk about the importance of STEM programs and why the youth need to be engaged in STEM activities? Oh, that's a great question. And um, I, I do feel that way. I think the, um, the importance of STEM is, you know, in, in, a, in a nutshell, you know, it teaches you to look at the world and to, to break things down into simple pieces that you can do something with and then take simple pieces and build them into solutions to, to address the real world problems that are out there. And so to, to be able to critically think and communicate and then design things that, that improve life for all people. And so it, it is a challenging educational path to walk, uh, but that shouldn't be a deterrent. That should be the reason. Just like we go to the gym and we put weights on the bar, it's making us stronger. A STEM education is a challenging climb, but you know, once you're at the top and you get to see that view, uh, you know that it was worth it. So uh, there's this thing in the aerospace industry called the gray wave where we're retiring more engineers than we're, we're making. And that is a, an impact on our country and the globe uh, in terms of folks that have the, the ability to work in the science and technology field. And so it's important. We need to make many more engineers and scientists. And so I, I would love to go everywhere that I can and to encourage young people to to, uh, to study it as much as they can, even if it's as a hobby or a minor. It's, it's very important to the, to the world, to all of humanity. All right, let's take a question from Twitter. How are you feeling leaving the planet and how do you expect the planet to change when you get back in six months? Anybody? Well, you know, okay, so I've got, there are a lot of feelings swirling around right now. You know, I'm, I'm really focusing on keeping them inside because we've got a lot of things to do. But I do think about it. And the, the biggest emotion or feeling or thought is that it just, it's surreal. I wake up and I go, I, I really am at Kennedy Space Center. And, and we really are less than a week from launch. I'm excited. Um, I also am focused. I have a job to do. I have many jobs to do and I want to do them well. So there's a lot of emotion, and so I'm also focusing on trying to regulate those things and trying to keep them uh, from, from distracting me so that I can, can do my job uh, and get to the station and be productive. But I'm, I'm really excited. It's an honor and a privilege to be here. There's a long legacy of people that have walked through these doors and, and then walked out of them, and I'm just looking forward to, to being a part of that. Yeah, and then um, in terms of you know, what are we expecting from a change when uh, six months from now, um, you know, I think I think uh, as Victor alluded to earlier, the pandemic, if if uh, the vaccine is out there and, and that can allow people to uh, to get out a little bit more and get back to to, I guess, what we would consider normal, a little bit more normal, that uh, that would be nice. You know, it's interesting. Uh, uh, Chris Cassidy, right, he launched right at the beginning of this and he's landed right at the at the end uh, or it's it's still going on. And so for him. Uh, things didn't really change in, in that last six months. So uh, hopefully we'll have a different outcome. All right. 
Thank you so much for taking questions today. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have. Um, I apologize if we didn't get to your question. We wish Crew One the best of luck. We'll be cheering you on. Um, for media, the next event will be the Flight Readiness Review Media Teleconference tomorrow. Stay tuned to NASA.gov for details. Be sure to watch this crew launch on Saturday on NASA TV, online at nasa.gov slash live, or on Facebook Live on the NASA Facebook page. Coverage starts on NASA TV at 3.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, everyone. Crew one. Crew one.